Hola a todos, todos bienvenidos. Voy a hacer la introducción en inglés directamente para que Ito pueda seguirnos. Eh, como sabéis, seguimos con el servicio de traducción simultánea si alguien lo necesita. So, uh, dicho esto, después de un largo día para algunos de, algunas de vosotras. Uh, hello again. And welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. As you know, this conference is part of the Art and Thought Laboratory Contact Zone. We started yesterday with three important interventions. On the one hand, by Mabel Tapia and Zenka Bobinac, who are here with us, who created a dialogue on different scales based on the concept of situated museum, inherited from Donald Haraway's situated knowledge. Quite interesting, very, very good. Yesterday, we had also Paul Walder's proposal, who introduced us to the dichotomy or strange evolution of some kind of museums or art centers understood as a white cube versus metaverse, versus or in evolution too. Idea to which he approaches among several references to the text of Ito Steyer, who in fact is with us today. Hi Ito, welcome. Uh, Ito Steyer lives in Berlin, where she teaches new media art in Berlin University of the Arts and founded the Research Center for Proxy Politics, together with Vera Tolman and Boaz Levin. Her work has been the subject of several monographic exhibitions and has been included in many international events, such as the 58 Venice Biennale. With her unique language combining satire and criticism, the work of German artist Ito Steyl has acquired considerable international recognition in recent years, resulting from a very personal view of documentary film. This work has developed since the beginning of the 2020 in the form of immersive videos and multimedia installations, combined with a spirit of research and experimentation. Although Tito Steyl uses the latest technologies, it's in order to question their power to influence, to influence the public in her capacity to refresh in a subterranean manner that which faces for real. Her already famous works such as How Not to be Seen or Factory of the Sun deliver up an irresistible satire of the excesses of global surveillance and the reduction of the world to a data center in the hands of the highest bidder. Attentive to the future of a state institutions, Ito Steyl tackles from more than one point of view the growing action of multinationals in the whole social sphere and the public arena. So with this, with this short introduction, I will leave uh, and I'll pass the voice to Ito. Thank you very much for joining us today. Also, uh, we are so sorry because we know that we have been explaining several um, mediums that it's important the presence in this program, but all of you know that we are living strange times with this pandemic uh, and virus around us. And today with Ito, we'll make this um, extraordinary uh, uh, presentation but of course we are really happy because it's also difficult to sometimes to find the moment to have changed also the dates and um, schedules are not, are not always easy so ha thank you also for your effort for being here even if it's, if it's to the screen and all for you thank you Thank you so much for this most generous introduction. Muchas gracias por esta introducción tan generosa. Would you kindly mute your end or I will Por favor, pueden enmudecer la traducción. El micro, hay, hay que enmudecer. El... Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. I hear you're having a seminar about institutions and how to rethink institutions in these times. So I tried to adapt my presentation to the topic of institutions and what to do within, with them now. And I'm assuming that I'm addressing a public that mainly works in or with or around institutions and that basically sees all of these issues from uh, the inside, or let's say from a perspective 
of lived experience. Uh, I think it was only yesterday, a report has been published by UNESCO, uh, which is called Disruption and Resilience, which monitors the effects of pandemia until now onto the cultural sector and has quite shocking findings. 66% drop in site visitations, 52% decline in revenues, 53%, um, that's a huge amount of temporary stuff made redundant, 40% of permanent stuff, huge, um, even though there is more gross value being added, there are job losses which are estimated at 10 million worldwide, especially for freelancers. As we all know, museums have been closed, 70% drop in attendance, 50% uh, of museums noted a reduction in public subsidies, in some cases as high as 40%. So basically these are, and also UNESCO um, points out that the digital sector has been increasing a lot in culture during pandemia, but mostly with the effect that artists stopped getting paid, which is of course one of the larger consequences of digital extraction, which is now affecting the cultural sector due to pandemia even more uh, extremely. So these are hard data. Um, which in a way all of us have been <laughs> experiencing uh, from some perspective or another, some from the job of opportunities, of income, of exhibitions, other like myself with chronic rescheduling, um, constant closures, lockdowns, closure of shows, the fact that everything is getting much more complicated from traveling to transport to basically anything. And that just to keep in a way mm, the standard of, of activities that one did pre-pandemia is now at least two or three times more exhausting. And that's usually on the bodies of the, you know, contributors of the cultural field that this keeping up or trying to keep up with standards is happening. And of course, these are kind of first world problems. I see a lot of mental health issue also, especially with my younger colleagues, there is isolation, uh, deprivation, depression, and so on and so on. I think you all know this. I don't have to really, really reiterate it. We all know it from one end or the other. So what I tried to do is basically perform some sort of experimental of where institutions find themselves situated during this time of crisis and pandemia, uh, maybe with a view of um, overcoming the deadlocks present within this map in direction of something more productive and also enjoyable. And I used a form which is well known from memes, which is the form of the political compass. You have four quadrants and uh, which indicate political, basically indications, inclinations or ideologies. Uh, on, in my case, I modified it a bit to have a reactionary pole on this end, a progressive pole in that one. And this axis, the V axis, is defined by pandemia's mandates or also requirements of distance and closeness. So this is the distant pole, and this is the close pole, which now got hidden under this line somewhere. Anyway, this is supposed to be the close end of stories uh, of of um, of the of the axe. So now you have four quadrants: one which is reactionary distant, progressive distant, progressive close, and reactionary close. And I will go through each of them. And I suppose that, you know, all the things that I've written into these quadrants could be, of course, it's just a beginning of a preliminary list. You could find 
many, many more details, but I think that many of the phenomena experienced in the cultural sector during pandemia could be mapped on there. And basically my whole presentation has just one point. One needs to sort of overcome the deadlock of being stuck on this, sort, uh, on this side of the quadrant and try to move to this one and to try to found um, institutions which may as well be experimental or para institutions which correspond to this side here of the spectrum. So let me go through um, all these quadrants starting with those over here on, the, on this side. Um, let's start with the reactionary close one. The first thing I really see in my eyes when thinking about it are the anti-vaxxer and conspiracy protests that took place a lot of them in Germany, but in many countries around the world, where quite routinely you would have people who were wearing uh, t-shirts saying, uh, giving out free hugs or something like that. So there were a lot of people that wanted to give hugs, that wanted to avoid any sort of, you know, medical distancing or social distancing that were refusing to wear masks, but on the other hand, were insisting on a closeness that was, in our case, at least very often based in the closeness of race and ethnicity. So um, this was one of the main and quite, in my view, not surprising, but quite overwhelming occurrences of pandemia to see so many people out in the streets here, those guys are trying to storm the German parliament in December 2020. They, they, are, they almost managed, they didn't. Um, but on the other hand, you know, uh, ex apart from these phenomena, which clearly have to do with pandemia, we also have an enforcement of presence especially in the art field, which predates pandemia and which, which has a lot to do also with other sectors of the economy. Very often the, the real estate sector, for example, many residency programs are made to get artists or to mm, move artists into a state of almost compulsory migration to draw social activities to parts of cities that are supposed to be upgraded, if not gentrified. So I have the feeling that many residency programs are made as a sort of simulation of any sort of social and that artists in many cases are used almost as some sort of NPCs, you know, like in, in The Sims. Um, the characters that populate the streets in order to simulate social activity, in order to you know, upgrade certain areas. Or also an economy of presence, which I've described in some of my earlier work. It always used to puzzle me that you know, I'm a filmmaker, mainly video artist, so my work can perfectly exist without me. It, there is no reason for me to be next to it. And I wouldn't have been able to have any sort of career if that wasn't the case, because for most of my working life, I had a small daughter to take care of. So basically, if I couldn't have sent my work on, instead of me, I wouldn't have had any sort of working life whatsoever. So it always puzzled me why, in many cases, the presence of the artist is so much more important than the artwork itself, right? And that it's, it seems to be so much more interesting to talk not necessarily with, but about the artist, um, instead of, you know, focusing on, on, on the work, which perfectly can exist um, without the artwork. I've written a long text about this phenomenon, which I call the terror of total Dasein, in which artists sometimes get dragged around as if they were, you know, animals in sort of petting zoos. And the interesting thing is that the value of presence, of course, because presence, and this also needs to be said, is the most 
face-to-face uh, -face communication is just the best form of communication. No one doubts that, especially not after pandemia. It creates the most, you know, meaningful, nuanced um, encounters that humans probably can have. Um, on, on the other hand, it also has become a quite more rare and valuable com commodity during pandemia and because of pandemia and this sort of commodification of peasants is one of the issues that we are seeing um, within pandemia. In a way, enforced closeness for reasons that are, have not, that are not primarily to do with art. Let me now move to this other sector here, which we, of course, most of us also have experienced during pandemia, which is the reactionary distant sector and which mainly is um, an area, a virtual space, which has long, long since um, been colonized by five or six big corporations. Um, and whenever we enter that space, and many of us had to, or increasingly had to during pandemia, then we are entering basically a gated private community that belongs to these corporations, and we are acting and speaking under their terms, and whatever we do is increasing basically their profit. We are, of course, not only doing our own activities, but we become some sort of raw material to extract data and to form behavioral patterns upon. And during pandemia, there were a lot of different manifestations and even, well, I hesitate to call it innovations, but maybe new phenomena happening on this field. Um, of course, Zoom was the earliest such uh, phenomena. Um, then there was the online viewing room, which uh, was quite popular during the first months of pandemia, which was basically just a website which simulated a gallery, a gallery wall almost always in concrete, and then you could Photoshop some kind of painting onto. That was uh, something that was quite um, popular in the art fair sector. Um, then, of course, uh, you had the proliferation of messenger services, uh, telegram, signal, proliferation of conspiracy theories, and so on over these messenger um, systems. Then, of course, in 2021, the big NFT craze, or let's say the burgeoning Web3 um, art world, which was sort of fast prototyped in parallel to the existing art world, and which happened because there was a superposition of at least three factors. The first of them was there was a crypto boom, and a lot of people had a lot of money in their pockets, but at the same time, they were also sat at home and didn't know what to do and were quite bored and wanted to shop, basically. And the NFT phenomena was an interesting place, not only to shop, but to basically play gamified shopping. And the third, third very important phenomena was, of course, that there was a lot of artists that didn't have any sort of other mm, option. The show had been canceled, uh, programs uh, canceled, there are even schools uh, closed, people sat at home with no income. So basically, depri artists deprived of other opportunities was the first, was the third um, criteria to make the NFT boom happen in such a short time. And um, this radicalized many of the developments we had seen already in the installation of Web2 or social media on top of Web1, uh, Web3, or the let's say the NFT part of it was really some sort of innovation was that was imposed from above, meaning from big players um, to sort of fast prototype or also simulate uh, a market for art, an alternative market for art, and then. 
I think it will be around for quite a while to come and I will talk about it later on also a bit when I come to some projects. So um, I want to show you because here there's some name of works or projects of mine which somehow relate to those quadrants. Um, I will show you now one work which I did in 2000, I think 20, the last year's a complete blur for me. I can't tell you what year it's now, but you know, one of these recent years, um, which is called Social Sin and which actually takes place inside a fictional art institution under the conditions of pandemia and all sorts of other things uh, happening as well. And at one point, this menu appears on screen uh, for some kind of interactive app where you are given the choice if you want to die from illness, from police, from starvation, from dancing. Uh, and <laughs> the only option you get is to press yes. And you just have to press yes to all of them. And in a way, for me, this applies to this situation where you're basically stuck in between those two sectors and the only choice you're given is to say yes to them because there seem to be uh, not very many other options. So first thing I would like to do is to show you some minutes from this work social sim in which a bunch of avatars are dropped into a strange art institution which has been uh, almost completely automated where all the artworks are self-generating and generative and then the bunch of avatars starts to uh, freelance in there as a performance collective to perform a social choreography called Dancing Mania. I will just show you maybe five minutes uh, of, out of it. And maybe if you could just give me a visual sign if the sound goes through once I press play. This is a social simulation. It is a simplified model of human interaction. This one shows how waves of discontent spread through populations. This sim shows a society where several groups live together. Now they start falling apart. Now one group exterminates the other. This is about lockdown riots. This shows museums that were automated, closed and replaced by virtual reality maps. Social sims are social abstractions. Then someone realized they work as art too. My name is Speznaz Kuhn. I dropped from the sky. They kicked us off a plane without oxygen to find some pricey painting. We landed with severe hypoxia. As we tried to make our way out, we found out our unit got defunded. But then we managed to access the secret VIP room. Previously on this series, inside the secret VIP room. This space is actually a joke. Management uses it to automate artworks. These are self-evolving artworks. These things evolve to get smarter, fitter, 
richer. This thing learns to walk. These things are looking for sponsors. Those that do not get enough points explode. Meanwhile, the squad retrained as a performance collective. Dancing manias came upon people after the plagues along the river Rhine. This performance shows how it spread, and along with it disinformation, conspiracy theory and scapegoating. Press I to infect a random squad member. People started dancing and never stopped again. Today this model can be used to predict many things. This is how racism spreads as pandemia. This is how conspiracy theories proliferate. This is a K-pop band sandbox for fan armies. Meanwhile strange things happen in the VIP room. Help. I have been kidnapped. I don't know where I am but I need to save the world. Instead I am getting dragged towards a feudal AI free port with decimated human rights standards. I want to lower my price ASAP. I swear to god I only saw Leo once when he brushed up my finger. I am proudly studio. Inside the performance art department the squad is performing for their lives. We are dancing for hire. For everyone that wants to model their shit. We get infected, we dance, we recover and then we get reinfected. It's about the survival of the fittest. The VIP room manages to send out appeals for help on Twitch. Hilfe, ich wurde entführt. Ich werde in Berlin festgehalten und Leute wie ich sind dort nicht besonders sicher. Manchmal verbrennen sie in Polizeihaft. It turns out Nefertiti is piloted by Heja. In der letzten Folge war ich nicht zu sehen, weil ich in türkische Gefängnis war. Ich konnte entkommen und würde zum scheiß Flüchtling. Meanwhile, Artworks transition from automated to autonomous. In Generation 1 this thing started to crawl. In generation 48, it had eaten its whole family. In generation 450, it sold at auction. In generation 4400, it sold its owner. In generation 44500, it turned into a mid-sized constitutional monarch. Maybe let's keep it here. That happens when not.
life merge and <laughs> have this kind of artworks um, emerging in a fully automated museum populated with half alive artworks. And actually, so the dancing mania you have seen is a real social simulation that we implemented that is based on an infection algorithm to predict you know, infection curves, but we made it to basically model dancing mania or the spread of infodemia, or fake news, and so on and so on. So this thing really works. You can walk around it. You can change the parameters if you want. Uh, people get infected, they dance, um, they start showing symptoms until they disintegrate and uh, respond to poor people to start performing all over again. Um, okay, so maybe I will move to this quadrant over here and show a different project which has to do with something I, or not I, a person called Michael Hertzfeld calls crypto-colonialism, but uh, this is not a sociological um, intervention at all. It's more like a, like a playful experimentation of the whole realm of blockchain, NFTs, and art institutions, and to find the overlap between them. Um, with my colleagues from the Department of Decentralization, who are very active in the blockchain um, art-related space, we found out that you can format or issue or mint any kind of art institution or any other institution as an NFT. I'm not going to bore you about with explaining what that is. In a way, it's completely irrelevant. It's a smart contract that tells you this is yours. Whether that's the case or not is up for debate. Anyhow, you can make NFTs out of basically any art institution by squatting their Ethereum address, is that one. Ethereum address is something like a normal web address, a URL, so you could also have sbalois.com or whatever museum, and you would have the same in the Ethereum namespace with the extension .es, which would also double as their Ethereum bank account. I think. So somehow out of coincidence, I started uh, NFTing the whole art world. As you can see, it's all mine. I squatted it. I also own a lot of other art institutions issued as NFTs, such as the Venice Biennial, the Patrimenta, MoMA, and so on. So it's all mine. But um, after the, the first one I tried to exchange with the students of the Royal College of Art. I told them, look, I'm going to give you your institution as an NFT if you give me a recording of a lab in which you have transformed these institutions into a workers and students self-managed institution. This was a year ago, uh, a couple months ago, they told me they are working on a film in which they are basically doing this and then we will basically perform this kind of hostage exchange. <laughs> they will give me their video, I will give them their institution to do with it whatever they want. But in, uh, of course I ask myself what else can I do with it? Um, and what is this, what does this idea of squatting actually mean? because this is a quite old procedure, which also happened in web one, you would squat someone's web address. You can basically register any web address you want if it's free. And uh, so I was asking myself, what is this process of squatting, which I know pretty well. This is something I discovered in a archive recently uh, from the mid eighties. You see, it's a scene of squatting, police violence, squatters are extracted from a squat. And this happens to be me down here. I, was very, I thought it was very funny to find myself in this situation. So you have to imagine this former me now doing that and squatting this type of territory. 
But what we are developing right now goes a little bit beyond it, you know. I think it's important to insist on the fact that we are not owning these um, institutions. We are not claiming any sort of property to them, but we are squatting them. We are basically keeping it open uh, for people to use um, without claiming any property rights in them. And so what and who are we squatting it for? So the next thing we are now making is uh, mm, experimental democratic process whereby, which we will um, stage in another of the squatted art institutions, the Bundeskunsthalle, which is a federal art institution in Bonn, where we will have three different proposals by different groups on how to run and to govern this domain, the Bundeskunsthalle.is domain, in a more democratic form using or not like blockchain technology. And we have implemented a voting tool that includes the so-called quadratic voting function. It's very technical. I'm not going to go into detail with that. It's something that was under discussion in the blockchain space around 2017, and that claims to improve the democratic process by eliminating the tyranny of the majority. So basically we went through the whole process of implementing it to see if it works or not, or why it doesn't work, if it doesn't work. And actually we did find out it doesn't really work. But so the idea is to have a live voting process whereby different governance models and participation models for this squatted um, domain are being put to a public vote and uh, which will basically give us the opportunity to introduce these governance models in the first place. For example, one of the groups, a group called Other Internet, would suggest a model of an art institution in which you know, all the departments are organized in subdomains and basically every transaction is recorded, especially financial flows, are recorded transparently on the blockchain for people to at least see the financial flows behind such institutions and so on and so on. I'm not going to go into detail. It's just to say that this project is about imagining different um, forms of governance of virtual art institutions. We are talking about the blockchain domain here, or let's say some proto-para blockchain domain. It's also a fact that I would say 90% of all blockchain pro projects are not on the blockchain for a number of reasons. But anyway, so this will be create some sort of experimental process to sort of fill those squats with life and at least stage some kind of process and process could be really seen in the juridical sense like having some sort of court scene you know to um to start a process of reflection about the governance of virtual art institutions because and we have seen that in this uh, political quadrant the main uh, way in which the virtual art institution is imagined is the metaverse or the open C NFT platform or the online viewing view. So can we have any alternative to that question mark? And I will gladly tell you that I think this experiment is failed in a productive way. So we know that there are some, to, some things that are not mm, not very productive to use if you want to have a democratically progressive process. Okay. Um, yeah, here is another one. Uh, let me just check my notes briefly. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's maybe first go to, yeah, let's go to this project here, Extra, Extra Spacecraft, which also imagines an institution, but in a double way. So 
Extra spacecraft is part of a video installation of which I'm going to show you like five minutes. And it is set in a real former institution, which is the National Observatory or was the National Observatory of Iraq, meaning it was an observatory on top of a mountain and people used to watch the stars and conduct astronomical research and, and so on. Uh, now this uh, institution does not exist for reasons that you will uh, see pretty clearly in the video. But the video is not a documentary. It uses this um, location as a backdrop to imagine a fictional institution which is called the ASA or the Autonomous Space Agency. Uh, which consists, as you can see in reality, by many of my colleagues who are doing cameos, like Trevor Paglen, Ada Kilomba is also performing as a member of the Autonomous um, Space Agency. But the idea is that, you know, the next space travel will happen on Earth and one will just open up a parallel dimension of reality, which looks exactly like reality, but everything will be different. And I'm going to show you five minutes from this work now. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you some other aspects of it, which are not apparent from the work itself. Генерал Яду Размани или Серджихани в Кане. Новели Кикстроки Сурмани. А Брахан Деке Параленде у Размани в Кане. А Хаманду Размани. Ле Женерина Лея Жигоша и Кдум. I'm very surprised to hear it. To Sandang, I can do a yummy mint to a mu rong. I have wooing feet to a mu rong. Go, 
大家陷入代表某种的统治，两团陷入代表而你都飞向该夏天的木窗。来到本场令人甜蜜、改变的空气新鲜，含着阿木条有人灿烂色的木珠。Okay, let's keep it here. So basically, there's this fictional institution on the top of the mountain in the site of the former, let's say, universal, universe-related institution, but it also the Asa also. Started existing in reality for a while, and became an institution to basically give grants to our colleagues from the region, from Mesopotamia, who got stuck with a lot of political turmoil. I mean, this is the time when basically Daesh is maybe 80 kilometers away from the site we have seen, and so it transitioned to some extent, at least for a while, from. A fictional or speculative institution into a real solidarity institution, and that's something that has become increasingly important for me to create those speculative models in a way, in order to transition them at least partly into reality, not as they are, but、uh, in a translated way. I'm going to end. Um, I'm going to yeah, end on another project, which I think, in my view, maybe falls, at least from the point of view of my collaborators in this project, in this quadrant here, which is progressive but in a way local or vernacular, or not distant in any case, is based on the neighborhood. Um, I think that the, the term vernacular cosmopolitanism has been coined by a colleague of mine called Fernando Garcia Dori. It's very interesting and also important, especially in times of pandemia, to consider when travel is in many cases interrupted and as well as contact. And for example, in Berlin, we had so many so expensive and hugely failed. Attempts to try to create some simulation of being a global nation or a big imperial nation or something like that—a nation that is able to wield a large lot of control over different and diverse territories. We have a big institution called Humboldt Forum, <laughs> which is full of looted art, as it turns out. Which was built at tremendous cost during the past around 50 years to do precisely that, to pretend that Germany is a nation that is able to include or subdue or whatever you might call it a lot of other other places in the world. But I think that Berlin, as, ma as many other places. Has so much basically difference in sight in the person of the people that actually live there, and if you hand it over such an institution to basically all the different people that live in Berlin and created something like a museum of vernacular everyday cultures,、uh, it would be much more interesting. And this is,、um, I think, one way to animate. This idea of vernacular cosmopolitanism—it is the difference that's on site that is mostly overlooked and not valued, that is seen as、um, subaltern in many cases. But in many places, it already exists, and、uh, even during times of extremely、uh, reduced、uh, contact and exchange. Let me now come to this last. Work here. It's a work called Free Plots.、Uh, there have been three editions up to now, and they kind of all look similar. They have this shape of planters,、um, in which 
local community gardens grow whatever plants they see fit to grow. Now, how did this work come about? Uh, at one point, I realized that I was getting income from art sale from a free port located foundation from the free port of Geneva. And um, then I said, okay, let's reinvest that money into something useful. So I went to see this nice little fellow over here and bought two tons of manure from him and his colleagues and uh, donated it to uh, Konin's garden close by where I live in Berlin. This was the pilot um, to see what we can do. And we made these planters in the shapes of free ports. This is actually Geneva free port and filled it with the compost uh, of the men of the horse manure and uh, gave it to the to the community gardens to basically fill with life. Um, the first one, which is the pilot, it's not really part of the series. They chose to have an educational garden um, because they also have a seed bank. So they were growing things from their seed bank to show to school children and so on. Um, there were also other editions. Uh, the first one was a fierce and impressive lady, Rosa Reyes in the El Catano Community Garden in Spanish Harlem in New York, which is this one. She was running a community garden in that area, which was very much um, jeopardized by gentrification. She chose to grow a plant which is called the flamboyant. As in, I can't really pronounce it correctly, flamboyant. A hibiscus, which is local to Puerto Rico, where she uh, was born and she told us lots of stories of how she kept going back, especially after the hurricane Maria to assist in um, disaster relief for the inhabitants of the island and her community garden work was very much associated by that, uh, with that. The second was in Toronto with these wonderful ladies from the Parkdale Milky Way Garden associated to uh, English as second language class run in a nearby facility. And these were basically the people that attended the class. A lot of them from Nepal and Tibet. And they were growing food plants, which they were missing. Basically, they couldn't buy in Canada in supermarkets. Um, so they grew them in this wonderful little community garden. Um, the, my favorite is the stinging nettle, so they chose to plant the stinging nettle and some jasmine uh, in the planters during the time of the free plots. It's transition from free ports to free, free plots um, in Toronto. And alongside every edition, we made an audio interview and the quotes are printed here on the planters and start superimposing. So after a while, it becomes a palimpsest of different languages, of different experiences, of different voices. Uh, this is the Luxembourg edition. And it's a really amazing community garden who <laughs> chose to grow potatoes and strawberries and told us of this very interesting experience of being Luxembourgians with their own language in some sort of free port and in a way the whole um, the whole country is a free port uh, in which basically most of the inhabitants are expats that are associated to the financial industry that was also a quite um, interesting experience there's also a whole other layer to this which i'm not going to go into um, because it's a, a bit of a sidetrack but this is also about basically changing the database um, by producing images of flowers that are grown in those free plots. So these are some of the images which we train an AI with to basically morph uh, from one flower to the other. And why is that? Many AI engineers are still being trained on this very um, well-known database, which is the IRIS database. Um, 
invented in 1936 by a guy called Fisher, first published in the Annals of Eugenics. Um, it is still a foundational um, item, let's call it, in the education of people who want to go into visual recognition in machine learning. They are all trained using this data set of different irises. And they are supposed to distinguish those irises from one another. Now the thing that's not really known is that these irises, in fact, for Fisher were standing for human races, which we want, he wanted to distinguish, you know, looking at them. And he wanted to find basically uh, markers to be able to automatically distinguish them uh, via statistical operations from one another. And the idea is also to use our flowers to finally basically decolonize this database and uh, to replace it with something uh, which has very different, in this case, literally roots. Okay, so maybe this is uh, all I have to say for now. It's also an hour now, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ito. Can you hear me? No. It's okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ido. Ito, very inspiring talk. And uh, well, we will open the, the tour for the for questions of the people. Uh, I would start with just uh, a doubt. Uh, in fact, yesterday we were talking also about this fact of the crypto money or this new uh, state and i when i read in your screen the word um crypto capitalism no uh, no crypto colonialism sorry uh, i think it's quite interesting how to focus in this idea because um somehow in a moment where we are debating about this kind of last freedom in theory <laughs> i'm not agree but uh, arrival from technology again arrived from technology for me it's uh, interesting how we can put on the table the fact that uh, finally capitalism has been able to create uh, this last freedom inside the money itself i mean talking about capitalism of course no uh, so i mean isn't it perverse no, in somehow it's like they have uh, stole us whatever possibility to be free in somehow and if it's possible it's inside the money itself so it's quite crazy you know in somehow so i would like to ask you uh, if you can uh, talk us or explain us a little bit more about this kind of crypto colonialism to report to different structures and then how can it affect to the institutions, institutions itself, if it continue, if it continuing developing to an impregnating and colonizing, uh, if it exists uh, over societies and our relationships. Yeah, I mean, uh, crypto colonialism actually is an existing concept which I found really fascinating. I'm now sharing some excerpts from a new lecture I'm preparing my, with my two colleagues, Trakilovic and Dragosice, which is called Welcome to Crypto Slavia, where we go uh, into the basically mining, I think mostly mining slash NFT phenomena. And um, during this research, I came across a term which is literally called crypto colonialism, which I found super interesting. It was invented, I think, uh, nine years before the invention of Bitcoin. So it has nothing to do with cryptocurrency, but in a way it has a lot to do with cryptocurrency. Um, so crypto colonialism is applied to territories which are formally independent, but economically dependent. And they suffer basically an indirect form of economic uh, oppression. He defines it as the curious alchemy whereby certain countries which are buffer zones between the colonized land 
are compelled to acquire their political independence at the expense of massive economic dependence. And these are some examples of what I would consider crypto colonialism in the crypto field, right? This is something called world coin. I don't know, I mean, it's probably a, a, a scam, right? Not a joke, it's a scam. It's a coin which was invented around three months ago and which was given out to people in um, the global south, in some countries in the global south, in exchange for their iris to get scanned by this weird kind of orb here. <laughs> so they would have to submit their iris identity scan in order for some probably completely worthless crypto entity. And these are other people around the world, whether it's fake or not, it's impossible to verify uh, in different locations which are submitting their identities uh, to the orb in order to get this kind of world coin. So basically people have formal independence in all of these countries, but actual economic uh, dependency. So that's one of the examples. Another of the examples is something I really found fascinating. Um, the example of the missing six minutes in European time. So it's a couple of years ago, I think in 2017 or 18, um, it, the six minutes suddenly in 18, millions of digital clocks started lagging in Europe in January three minutes disappeared in February, three more. What happened? The European grid had become affected by huge power fluctuations emanating from the grid, electrical grid in the shared between Kosovo and Serbia. They share one grid and there's a huge amount of crypto mining in this region. I think Kosovo just literally stopped it um, or wants to stop it like right now, more or less. But um, the power uh, sucking from that grid, which happened because of the unclear and contested geographical location of this area and the fact that electricity is more or less for free there because of all these political tensions caused the grid to fluctuate in a way that six literal minutes went missing from European time. <laughs> I was saying that it's a very interesting example of crypto colonialism when basically the idea of mining crypto can go as far as to attack or affect literal time space. I mean, there were, there were a really interesting dimension where time and maybe also space get sucked up into sort of this crypto vortex. So, and we have lots of other examples for crypto um, colonialism. Um, we were talking to a lot of people who are mining actually in many of these regions as far as Kazakhstan. And I think it's a very fascinating uh, development to follow, especially when you make, uh, when, when you realize that basically every NFT that is mined on OpenSea or, or God knows where has to pass through all these, you know, power cables. If you have ever been to Pristina, then you know that the power cables are some kind of uh, unique, unique installation. They are all over the place. The electricity flows through all these different cables which form almost nest-like structures. And I see, you know, one NFT after another lighting up inside these cables waiting to be minted in those locations where electricity comes from sources that are not sustainable in many cases and create lots of knock-on problems. Thank you. Uh, someone wants to ask something. Uh, thank you very much, Hito, for this wonderful presentation. It was really shocking. Uh, 
uh, to hear the effects of COVID uh, to the precarious workers and institutions. It's really, you know, it's, um, we know about it, but it's, it's the, the percentage that you presented from the beginning um, surprised me. I didn't know um, about it. And um, the question is, of course, we were discussing today in our workshop, what, what is the future of, of the museum and we didn't discuss enough the, the effects of COVID, how the COVID, the pandemic will um, affect the institution in different uh, terms. Uh, so you mentioned um, some, some important ideas and uh, approaches, uh, how to, uh, think uh, the institution in more just way. For example, the, the institution should be more transparent. Uh, there should be more solidarity, uh, more uh, communal uh, collaborations. Uh, and you also spoke about the vernacular cosmopolitanism regarding the institution. So, this point was, uh, for me, very interesting, and I would like you to say more about this uh, importance to have everyday culture in the museum and how it is related to the, to, to the, to the uh, effects of COVID and everything, what, uh, how, how the situation uh, is reflected uh, today in the institution and how we can think about uh, the, uh, its future. So this vernacular cosmopolitanism in relation to the future of the institution, I would like to hear if you can say a little bit more. I'm not a museum person, so really I'm not an expert, but I think we have all witnessed how not only this COVID, but way before uh, processes of deglobalization started tearing into the cultural landscape because of populism in many cases, um, because of you know, processes like Brexit and, and reactionary populism, in fact, in many countries, uh, not only in the West, but in many in the West. And so basically deglobalization or the diminishing of contact between locations precedes the pandemia. Um, and pandemia just exacerbated a process that was happening already, a process of the loosening of ties, of the lessening of communication across borders. You know, I mean, most countries are tied up in their own problems and whatnot, and there is enough problems <laughs> to deal with. So in a way, it's understandable that, you know, you sort of lose a, a scope um, of thinking and of exchange within this ongoing mess, but you know how to recreate it even when the material horizons and the opportunities shrink. That's a question for me. And you know, very early on in my work, this does probably not apply to every location in the world, but to many more than one might expect. I started noticing that if you just look around yourself in your daily life, then the world is always already there somehow, you know, it will materialize. You just need to find it. And usually it's overlooked. It's considered irrelevant or unimportant. One recurrent example in my early career was uh, the experience of being a person of color or a migrant <laughs> was never very much. I mean, that has been changed now, but uh, not 20 years ago, it wasn't very popular. So anyway, the world is mostly always already there. With Fernando, it was also interesting to discuss like how much it is always already there, even in many rural locations, which are definitely not seen as cosmopolitan areas through all sorts of, you know, labor migration, depopulation, repopulation, et cetera, et cetera. But I think one can try to shift one's attention on the cosmo 
polytheism that exists basically in the everyday. Um, you know just as well as me that the vernacular is a term that was taught by, coined by Ivan Illich um, to talk about, you know, languages, uh, mother tongues, as he called them, that were minor in relation to dominant languages. So there's a whole world of, you know, references that are waiting to be re-explored so we don't have to suffer the lessening of communication and exchange, but can be articulated in a different way. And also having said that, you know, there's also, um, it's not only a bad thing that mass travel on EasyJet is now much more difficult, right? That wasn't exactly great. The whole art world was running on these 5.30 a.m. 17 Euro flights from A to B where people were dragged around basically for meetings or something. That's also unsustainable and not uh, something that can be continued, I think. So we group um, try to find also, this is one aspect of the quadrant that I have um, neglected a bit, but we basically also need to find different ways of being online, um, having municipal control, for example, over platforms, um, platform cooperatives and all of that, so that also we can enable a exchange in a distance which is not immediately colonized and co-opted by corporations. Thank you. Someone else. Don't be afraid if you don't know or somebody has some problems with English because translators are helping us also in this open. No, just um, thank you very much for your presentation, which was amazing. Um, and more or less in the same um, idea, you, you talked about a speculative model to the passage from speculative models to um, real solidarity institutions. So, um, and of course, I think, or you tell me, um, how do you see this passage? And how can how can this budget uh, this passage can be operated, and of course how the art artists and the cultural sector in cultural workers, in general, can also produce or cooperate to produce this uh, passage. I think there are quite a few models for that. You know, some of my colleagues also in the blockchain space have pioneered, for example, the idea of educational live action role play. I'm sorry, I, I usually don't talk like this so slow. I'm just afraid that otherwise my voice will be um, destroyed by some kind of glitch. So forgive me if I sound like an idiot. I'm just trying to talk slowly. Um, so what is educational live action role play or life, a lab? It's basically the simulation of situations in order to train them, to test them, to fast prototype them and to play around with them to see whether they you know, are valuable at all. I think it's very important that ideas are tested before being put pues de estar ideas. Ah, maybe you can mute the room, otherwise I hear the translation. It's important to test ideas be before putting them into practice. I mean, basically everyone does that, that's developing basically anything. Uh, things need to be put through a very, very long process of testing by real people, otherwise they won't work. And in this process, usually a lot of things change. So maybe, you know, one of the examples, uh, actually my next work is going to be all about that, but it's not finished. So I'm not going to talk about it right now, but uh, let's say the stage event of, you know, trying to 
experimentally produce a democratic participation process is also a kind of testing example. Um, before putting something into practice, just see, does it hold? Does it work even? You know, you can have it in a paper, in a mathematical algorithm, but will it hold in reality? So in that sense, I think that creating from the side of institutions, creating the possibilities for experimentation for institutional models would be very important. What, someone else? Alguien más? No. no that's, um, so do you do you see the the virtual sphere as a place, a, a real place for uh, this for um, experimentation? In, in a very large sense. <laughs> we cannot hear you. In a, in a dystopic sense, it is already a sphere of large scale experimentation, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's for sure. So I don't think it's a good idea to replicate that to basically replicate the mechanisms of gamification and trying to get people addicted to dopamine hits via the internet. I think that's horrible. Um, but on the other hand, I think that one should stay engaged to at least know what's going on, because if we don't know, then we will be fucked, period. So I'm very skeptical uh, definitely when it comes to any sort of progressive um, uh, promises of digital innovation, I'm very, very skeptical. But I still think that you need to try and test things in order to understand them because um, they will be implemented. What, someone will implement them. Uh. So we, we, we leave it here. Uh, thank you very much, Ito. Really an amazing and inspiring talk. So a lot of things to think in common, for sure. And thanks to all of you. Gracias a todos, todas, por acompañarnos a, a, a lo largo del día de hoy. Y para aquellos que estáis en la aventura, eh, nos vemos mañana. Gracias. Thank you.